Yes, uh, good afternoon, everyone. It, it's a real pleasure to be here um, uh, in, in Vienna, and thank you very much uh, for the invitation. My name is Dan Royston, I'm a hematopathologist um, working in Oxford. And over the next 20 minutes, I'd like to give you a, a, dis a, a description of some of the work we've done in the last few years that really represent a quite novel a collaboration between members in pathology, hematology, and biomedical engineering uh, in Oxford. Um, I have no conflict of interest to declare, but I'm open to uh, tempting offers, uh, possibly over an expensive uh, Viennese dinner. Um, so as an overview, um, what I'll do is talk a bit about some of the work we have applied to uh, megakaryocyte morphology and fibrosis in bone marrow trophines. I won't say too much about the basic principles of artificial intelligence and machine learning. Suffice it to say that these are powerful techniques which are finding increasing application in, in academia and also uh, in, in the commercial sector. A very important tool uh, in the repertoire of machine learning is the application of these convolutional neural networks. Very, very powerful techniques uh, for image analysis. And so very naturally a found application uh, in pathology. And in the last few years, there's been an explosion of descriptions of how we can apply these neural networks uh, to tissue histology. Now, the morphology in MPNs is embedded in the WHO um, uh, classification scheme. And these are important features, both cellular features and features of the stroma. But it is absolutely clear that there is some controversy about the relative significance of individual morphological features and the consistency um, that pathologists are able to identify them. And there have been various publications looking to describe uh, the concordance or discordance uh, in these morphological uh, features. Now, of course, uh, in the field of the myeloid disorders and MPNs, there's been huge steps towards understanding uh, the basic driving factors uh, for this disease. Both single cell and bulk genomics have offered really tantalizing insights into the molecular drivers of disease initiation and progression. And really, the morphological features haven't kept uh, uh, up to pace with this. And really, we're looking at the same features um, now as we were 10, 20, 30 years ago. And pathologists like me, issue these text reports, which are descriptions of a kind of gestalt impression uh, of uh, the tissue that we look at. The tissue is highly complicated, it's data rich, it's a fantastic combination of features of uh, stem cell components, maturing myeloid populations, fat, bone, and stroma. So really I think there is a huge opportunity to move towards a more quantitative, descriptive um, uh, approach of the marrow that we can measure in an objective way really important features that inform and augment uh, the molecular insights we've seen. seen in recent years. I will briefly discuss uh, some of our published work around the megakaryocyte features and then go on to discuss more recent work uh, in which we've begun to look at fibrosis. So a couple of years ago, we built um, an image analysis pipeline uh, based upon routine prepared bone marrow trophine sections. So all the information, all the data I present today is based around either an HNE section from a routine laboratory, a four micron section, or a reticulin stained image. Um, all these are produced in every, most laboratories throughout the world. And so these are readily available and part of the routine workflow. So we built this model to train a machine learning tool to identify megakaryocytes, extract them from the slides, so we could do quantitative analysis of the cytomorphological features of the megakaryocytes and also their clustering and distribution in the marrow. We then wanted to find a way of describing these, way, these features in an intuitive way that was very easy to understand and can be used for further insights into the disease. There are various ways of representing this data. The problem is when you begin to look at multiple parameters, how do you represent this in an intuitive way? So in the end, from the megakaryocytes we harvested from both normal and MPN samples, ET, PV, and PMF, we extracted 12 features that corresponded to the cytomorphology of the megakaryocytes, their clustering propensity, and also their distribution uh, across the marrow. And in the end, we were able to uh, represent all these features using principal component analysis. And the attraction of this model um, is that you can suddenly begin to describe libraries of patients. 
and you can combine all these features. So this is really a PCA disease space of NPN samples. So both these images are very similar. Um, in the gray area here, we have the megakaryocyte features of normal or reactive marrows. In green, we have uh, the megas from cases of myelofibrosis. And in blue and yellow, we have polycythemia vera and ET. So this represents uh, all the megakaryocytes from around 150 patient samples. Now, the power of this is that against an index patient sample, a particular sample, you can plot the individual sample against this library of images. And on the right-hand side here, we have two patients, uh, one with a diagnosis of PV, one of ET, who subsequently transformed to post-PV or post-ET uh, myelofibrosis. And the point is that the morphological features of these megakaryocytes march across disease space. And this tracks the clinical progression, the clinical features, and also changes in the variant allele frequency of the driver mutation. So more recently, we've looked to identify and describe another important feature, which of course fibrosis and megakaryocytes. And this work has actually recently just been pre-published on MedArchives uh, this week, in fact. So fibrosis, um, again, is embedded in the classification scheme for MPNs. Um, we use the uh, WHO uh, grading scheme, which is a semi-quantitative grading scheme, where we grade fibrosis between MF0 and MF3. And with increasing fibrosis, fiber thickness, and intersections, we ascend these grades. Now, while there is some evidence that there is concordance in the grading between pathologists, what we cannot capture is the heterogeneity within grades and between grades. It's absolutely clear that not all MF2s and all MF3s are alike. And here's a real-life sample from a real-life uh, pathologist. This is what we actually see in routine practice. We've got a broken up, fragmented marrow. We have got some intact marrow spaces, so this is an interpretable specimen. Here we've got quite severe fibrosis. And here, far less fibrosis. What is the MF score? How do we capture that? It seems to me quite misleading to force that into a simple grade. We can't capture heterogeneity, and we can't quantitate the severity. So in response, what we wanted to do was to build a pipeline to find a way of quantitating these features uh, more systematically. And uh, to express this rather simply, what we did was we broke up the samples into small uniform tiles and then ranked all these tiles based upon their severity. And we trained a machine learning model to predict a score based upon this ranked order. Although powered by machine learning approaches, it was augmented and improved by human annotations. So we had this training model, a so-called learning to rank model, where human annotations refine and improve this ranking order of these tiles. And uh, with an iterative approach, we end up with a very powerful and accurate prediction. We can then use these tile scores, or these continuous index of fibrosis scores, to think about describing the disease in a more structured and rational way. This is what we get. This is a reticulin image of a standard reticulin stain bone marrow where each tile score is converted to a color. So we have a color map corresponding to the fibrosis. So in blue, we have tiles where there's very minimal fibrosis amounting to MF0. By contrast, the red tiles show quite severe fibrosis. So even at low resolution, and, high, uh, and low power, immediately you can see the heterogeneity in the sample. One's eye is drawn to areas of advancing fibrosis. So you can see foci of advancing fibrosis in a sea of non-fibrotic tissue. And this is very, very instructive and potentially very powerful. If we then look at these tiles and try to do um, uh, some quantitation statistics on these tile distributions, what we notice is that unsurprisingly, uh, in cases of MF, the average tile score is higher than other NPN types. Well, that's not a surprise. What's interesting, however, is that even though our samples of pre-PMF, which are by definition no more than grade one, they actually have higher average tile scores than ET. So we're not saying the MF grade changes, but the actual quantitation of the tiles is clearly different between pre-PMF and ET. If we look at the heterogeneity, that is the randomness of tiles, these tile scores, what we also notice is a significant difference between pre-PMF and ET. There's far more heterogeneity in pre-PMF, even though the average score is lower than PMF. It's more similar to PMF and PE than it is to ET.
We can then also look at what is the distribution of each of the tile scores. If you imagine all the tile scores in a rank, we can broadly divide them up into bins that broadly correspond to the conventional MF um, grade. Unsurprisingly, most of the tiles which are put in bin three, which are very fibrotic, are seen in cases of MF. Whereas in reactive and ET samples, most of the bins, most of the tiles belong to either bin zero or bin one. What's interesting is that we do see bins, or we see tiles rather, from pre-PMF that would amount to the equivalent of MF2, even though the actual score, based upon conventional assessment, is no more than grade one. Rather like the mega-carriage-like work, we can then look at these three features, that is the average tile score, the average SIF score, the variation of heterogeneity in the sample, and this bin distribution, and describe these in PCA space. And what we see then is at this part of the uh, top right hand of the figure, we can see all the PMF cases, which is severe fibrotic. And to the left, we see a mixture of reactive and some ET samples. And we begin to see pre-PMF samples peeling away from ET. As a pathologist, this is probably the most difficult differential diagnosis in MPNs. Rather like the megakaryocyte work, we can also use this description of disease space to track individual patients. And here I have an example of two patients, both of whom had a diagnosis of MF, who underwent uh, transplantation. The patient on the left never really seemed to respond very well. The blood counts remained fairly low. And there was no real normalization of fibrosis. There was minor improvement in fibrosis. But by 23 months post-transplantation, we had fibrosis very similar to that of the diagnostic sample. By contrast, on the right, this patient did very well. Um, the, initially, there was uh, subtle changes in fibrosis, but by 12 months, not only improvement, almost near normalization in the fibrosis. And this corresponded to the, the blood counts and uh, the clinical features. So really, we can then move away from saying, what, is the fe what are the features in this particular patient to what is the features in the context of the other samples we've seen? And I think that's potentially very, very informative and very useful uh, diagnostically. So having shown that there's some evidence of separating pre-PMF and ET using uh, these tile scores, we then uh, collaborated with members of the Mass Institute and asked the question, what are the more specific features that are really distinguishing these entities? And in the recent years, there have been several uh, techniques that come under the broad umbrella of this topological data analysis, which is really a complicated way of describing the distribution of data and data sets. And to cut a long story short, what we could show was that when we look at pre-PMF, one of the distinguishing features is even though the average score is not that high, we see these micro foci of fibrosis. Although they're not only are they increased in pre-PMF versus ET, they're not randomly distributed. They tend to concentrate in particular areas. These small micro foci of fibrosis. When we look at the intervening stroma, we also see that the fibrosis between these hotspots is slightly higher than the background stroma, which implies or suggests that maybe there's some early conditioning of the stroma in pre-PMF that's very, very hard to spot. And it has to be said, on morphological review, these are very, very hard to spot reliably. And um, uh, when we then combine all these features, the average tile score, the tile distribution, and the distribution of the bins, when we combine that with these topological features described as macrophocyte, we're then able to really begin to tease apart even more these ET and pre-PMF cases. And interestingly, when we look at patients who we know have subsequently transformed, if we look at the pre-transformed ET samples, a significant number of these pre-transformed ET sit in the space that's very, very similar to that of the pre-PMF samples we've analyzed in the initial cohort. Some clearly do have clearly ET-like features, but this suggests that maybe these fibrotic features are uh, going to be an important clue for patients who may subsequently uh, transform. And finally, I'll just say that really what we can now do then is combine these features, megamorphology and fibrosis, and think about a more refined way of integrating these features. And what we show is that when you combine fibrosis with these megakaryocyte features, we really can distinguish quite powerfully between ET and pre-PMF. And in these samples here, we have an area under the curve of about 0.94, which I think suggests we're on the verge of having a very reliable system for distinguishing between these important uh, subtypes.
And just to conclude, I will say uh, my view is that although these are just two examples of the targets we can look for, I think in the future we have the, the possibility to look at multiple features and build up a layered approach towards the marrow. So we can explore the marrow, the microenvironment through multiple lenses and build a more sophisticated and objective description of these morphological features. And uh, hopefully we'll be in a position to improve current classification schemes with objective scores that complement and inform the molecular output. But in the future also, maybe we can begin to uh, develop a, a set of tools where we can more reliably predict and describe subtle responses uh, to novel therapies. And I think particularly with the example of these microfoci pre-PMF, this is a very good way of hunting in bone marrow trephines for areas of interest that might tell us about the early stages of fibro fibrotic progression in, in, in MPNs. Now, with that, I'll come to, to a close and just say this has uh, really been a very enjoyable collaboration uh, in Oxford. I owe particular thanks to uh, my colleagues in engineering and also in haematology. And thanks also to CRUK for sponsoring uh, particularly the fibrosis work. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for this beautiful talk. And we have time now for questions in the room. But also remember that for those who are online with us, you can also ask questions that I will receive here. A question from Professor Mesa. So a very good talk and, and very intriguing, I think, on, on many levels. You know, first, I think the issue of fibrosis, which has always been so difficult to, to quantify, you know, in a way to support trials and other things. So you nicely showed the data as it related to patients post-transplant. Have you looked at it all in patients receiving medical therapy just to see either the stability of fibrosis or improvement with, with whatever therapy? Yeah, it's a really good question. We haven't done that. Um, really, the attempt here was to, to train a model to spot and identify fibrosis. That's a very obvious question to try and uh, correlate the change in fibrosis with therapy. It's a good point. No, we haven't done that yet. In just a, a second, but unrelated question, as it would relate to potential for potential communication between pathologists, is this a sort of technology where you know, pathologists in more remote areas may be able to scan the, the slide and then have this analysis done more centrally at Oxford or some other, other center? Yes, so the way we designed it is that we have a, an online portal, so you can upload the digital image and you can run the pipeline, not quite in real time, but not far off. And I think that potentially is a way of supporting centers where there's not heme path expertise. I would also add that even in teams, in my team, where there are four of us in the heme path service, what we find is that when you have this kind of automated output, it aids discussion. So rather than simply a, a disagreement about the grade, you can explain why you think grade is appropriate or not, and you can use it as a reference point for discussion. So I think the potential for non-experts and also for experts is significant. Great, thank you. Thank you, another question. Hi, um, Thomas Daniel from Novartis, Austria. I was wondering in your uh, analysis of megakaryocyte, how many cells do you need to have a confident uh, DC state progression estimation or, uh, I mean, to cut a long story short, how many cells do you really need to be confident on, on the prediction of the disease? And the second question is more related on how, is, how reliable is the method from pathologist to pathologist and from sample to sample? Did you try to analyze different type of samples and see if you have the same results? Yes, um, I'll answer the second question first of I may. You're absolutely right. Um, it's well known that um, uh, apart from the difficulty of applying the grading scheme, a very important question is the quality of the silver stain. And even within laboratories, there's huge variation. Um, we took the approach that we an analyzed samples or included samples that we regarded as being diagnostic. And so in a way, we deliberately slightly contaminated the data set to account for variation in thickness and staining intensity. And one of the powers of applying machine learning is that you can train models to predict outliers and to exclude cases which have significant artifact. So I think it's fairly robust. I think it's probably no less robust than routine reporting uh, by pathologists, which I guess is the, the, the measure that we should be comparing ourselves to. Um, in terms of the, the question around uh, the adequacy of the number of megakaryocytes required, we've always taken the view that for a sample to be included for analysis, it should be adequate for pathological interpretation. Most of the samples we use for the megakaryocyte model um, had between five and six intertrabecular spaces and between around uh, 60 and 150 or 200 megakaryocytes. Um, our feeling is that um, anything less than around 50 megakaryocytes, one should be very, very cautious. That being said, if you parse up individual bone marrow 
funds into small segments and ask the question, does the size affect the prediction? Remarkably, you can get very accurate concordance of the predictions based upon even small numbers of megakarya sites. But it's an important point to raise. We have to make sure the samples are good quality, well cut, and well stained and well preserved. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daniel. I Thank think you. we are just on time for the next presentation. So the, the second presentation will touch a subject that is coming in MPN field, uh, that is the immunotherapy. We have learned in the recent years the impact of such new therapies in cancer in general, but uh, information about MPNs, and Morten Oldstrom will discuss today a potential fantastic target for such treatment, which are the color mutations. Morten. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, first of all, I must say that I'm really honored that I've been given the opportunity to come here today and talk to, uh, talk to you about our development of a vaccine against mutant Kalar. So, therapeutic cancer vaccination, that is a cancer immune therapeutic modality. And just so we are, we are all like on par, we all understand what is the ultimate target of cancer immune therapy. That's what you see here. We have an effect immune cell that is able to recognize and kill a cancer cell. That is the ultimate goal. And in the setting of T cells, the question is, how do the T cells do this? Well, it's shown here. We have a, um, a cancer cell that develops a somatic mutation. The somatic mutation gives rise to a mutant protein. The protein is degraded into the proteasome and uh, into a peptide, and then in the endoplasmatic reticulum, the mutant peptide or neoantigen, as we call it, or neoepitope, is loaded into AGLA class one or AGLA class two complexes, and it's then presented on the surface of the cancer cell to T cells. We know that the immune system is able to recognize cancer cells through the recognition of new antigens, but we also know that in cancer, patient, uh, cancer patients, this mechanism is sim simply too weak. So what we need to do is to nudge on this mechanism by therapeutic cancer vaccination, for example. So what we do when administering a vaccine, we inject uh, DNA, RNA, or synthetic long peptide intradermally or subcutaneously uh, with, a, um, with an adjuvant. The antigen is then phagocytosed, processed by antigen-presenting cells. The antigen-presenting cells are activated because of the, of the adjuvant. And then the antigen-presenting cells, mainly dendritic cells, migrate to the lymph node where they prime and activate T cells that are specific for the antigen, for the new antigen, or the vaccination epitope. The T cells then migrate to the tumor microenvironment where they should at least recognize and kill the cancer cells some immune responses to the come here today and talk to, uh, talk to you about our development of a vaccine against mutant Kalar. So therapeutic cancer vaccination, that is a cancer immune therapeutic modality. And just so we are, we are all like on par, we all understand what is the ultimate target of cancer immune therapy. That's what you see here. We have an effect immune cell that is able to recognize and kill a cancer cell. That is the ultimate goal. And in the setting of T cells, the question is, how do the T cells do this? Well, it's shown here. We have a, um, a cancer cell that develops a somatic mutation. The somatic mutation gives rise to a mutant protein. The protein is degraded into the proteasome and uh, into a peptide. And then in the endoplasmatic reticulum, the mutant peptide or neoantigen, as we call it, or neoepitope, is loaded into AGLA class one or AGLA class two complexes. And it's then presented on the surface of the cancer cell to T cells. We know that the immune system is able to recognize cancer cells through the recognition of new antigens, but we also know that in cancer, patient, uh, cancer patients, this mechanism is sim simply too weak. So what we need to do is to nudge on this mechanism by therapeutic cancer vaccination, for example. So what we do when administering a vaccine, we inject uh, DNA, RNA, or synthetic long peptide intradermally or subcutaneously uh, with, a, um, with an adjuvant. 
The antigen is then phagocytosed, processed by antigen-presenting cells. The antigen-presenting cells are activated because of the, of the adjuvant. And then the antigen-presenting cells, mainly dendritic cells, migrate to the lymph node where they prime and activate T cells that are specific for the antigen, for the new antigen or the vaccination epitope. The T cells then migrate to the tumor microenvironment where they should at least recognize and kill the cancer cells. So when choosing to work with a new antigen, we need to understand that we can work with several classes of new antigens. First of all, we have the personalized new antigens. So there's been a lot of fuzz about personalized new antigens during the, the recent years due to this talk about personalized medicine. So personalized antigens are antigens that, are for, that occur only in the single patient. As you all know, Cancer patients harbor several mutations, somatic mutations, and these mutations give rise to different uh, mutant proteins. So to target a personalized new antigen, we need to sequence the somatic mutations in the tumor tissue, and then we need to use bioinformatics to, to predict the antigens, the new antigens that are formed by these uh, mutations. And then we, of course, need to produce uh, peptides and then inject the peptides into the patients. And needless to say, this is a quite laborious method. It's also it's costly and it takes some time. So another way we could do it is to target the shared new antigens. Unfortunately, shared new antigens are quite uncommon in cancer. In solid malignancies, one example would be the KRAS mutations that are quite frequent in panc pancreatic cancer. And in hematological cancer, we have the NPN1 mutations in AML and the JAK2 mutations in MPN and, of course, the Kalar mutations. So, back in 2013, when the Kalar mutations were described first, um, we started wondering, could these mutations maybe be immunogenic or could the mutations form immunogenic new antigens? And even though there are more, more than 50 mutations known, uh, in Kala, they all generate this 36 amino acid sequence that is shared between all, uh, all mutations. So we wondered, okay, this, um, this mutant C-terminus, it doesn't have any sequence homology with the wild-type C-terminal. So could this mutant C-terminal, could it potentially be immunogenic and be a target of specific T-cells and hence be used for therapeutic cancer vaccine? So first, first thing we did was that we um, isolated PBMCs from patients with Kalamutin MPN. And then we stimulated these PBMCs with peptides derived from the mutant Kalar. And what we found was uh, interferon gamma responses in, um, using in, uh, in vitro elispats. And we also identified CD8 positive T cell responses using intracellular cytokine staining and also CD4 positive T cell responses. And actually the most frequent responses were CD4 positive T cell responses. So by that we have shown that by stimulating PBMCs or T cells from Kalamut and MPN patients, we had a reaction from the immune system. But the most important thing would be to show that T cells specific to Kalar mutations are able to recognize and kill Kalar mutant cells. So we isolated dendritic cells and T cells from a patient with Kalar mutant uh, MPN. The dendritic cells were then pulsed with peptide derived from mutant Kalar, and the T cells were activated, started to proliferate and differentiate into effector T cells. Then we assayed whether cancer cells harboring the Kalar mutation were killed in a chromium-51 cytotoxicity assay, and we clearly showed that cells harboring the Kalar mutations, autologous cells harboring the Kalar mutations, were readily killed, whereas Kalar wild-type cells, autologous Kalar wild-type cells, were not killed. So by that we have shown that the Kalar mutations were recognized by CD4 positive T cells that were able to kill autologous cancer cells. And normally in, in our lab, when we discover aminogenic neoantigens or aminogenic epitopes in general, we also test whether healthy donors, they have an immune response to these, uh, to these epitopes. So we also tested immune responses in healthy donors against mutant Kalar. And before I proceed and show you the data, I would just like to remind you that the Kalar mutations have not been identified in healthy donors. There just uh, some years ago, there was a Danish population study showing that a minor, the very small fraction of healthy donors harbor the Kalar mutations. But generally, the Kalar mutations are only identified in patients with MPN and rare cases of MDS. 
So we didn't expect to find any immune responses against mutant Kala in healthy donors because their immune system have, ha, has not been challenged with mutant Kala. So we were quite surprised when we showed that more than 50% of healthy donors actually respond to stimulation with peptides derived from mutant Kala. So with these data at hand, we, we thought, okay, let's investigate which T cells actually are Kala specific. Are they naive T cells or memory T cells? So we isolated memory T cells and naive T cells and then challenged the cells to Kala. We stimulated the cells with, with Kala mutant peptides in uh, ellis Bart assays. And as you see here, this, the cells re that respond are memory T cells, whereas we don't see any response in naive T cells. So with these data at hand, we suggest, even though it might be a little bit controversial, that we have an active tumor immune surveillance against the Kala mutations in healthy donors. So we speculate that healthy donors from time to time generate a Kala mutation. However, given the exquisite immunogenicity of the mutations, the, mu the mutant cells are cleared, and we generate T memory cells to the mutations. So with this at hand, we thought, okay, why not try to reinstate the defect tumor immune surveillance in Kala mutant MPN patients? Let's take it to the clinic, to the bedside. To the bedside. And that is what Jakob did. Jakob, you see here, he was a PhD student at our institution. He just defended his uh, PhD thesis. And Jakob was tasked to perform a phase one clinical vaccination trial in 10 patients with Kala mutant MPN. Uh, he performed 15 vaccines over the course of one year uh, with a peptide derived from the Kala, mutant Kala C terminus with montanide as an adjuvant. The primary endpoint was toxicity because it was a phase one trial, secondary endpoint immune monitoring, and tertiary endpoint clinical response. So first of all, we wanted to find out whether the vaccine was safe and feasible, and indeed it was. We only had two cases of grade three adverse events, and these were actually deemed unrelated to the vaccine. And the majority of the adverse events that were registered during the trial were uh, adverse events that you normally see during a vaccination trial. So the vaccines, it was fear, safe and feasible to perform therapeutic cancer vaccines with, with Kala mutant uh, derived peptide. Next thing was the immune monitoring. And we were interested in, in assessing whether we saw an increase in the immune response to mutant Kala. And indeed we did, shown here by these interferon gamma early spots. It's shown that in this patient, we actually didn't find any response at baseline, but after repeated vaccinations, we saw an increase in the amount of specific T cells to mutant Kala, also shown here on this heat map for, for all patients uh, included in the trial. However, we also showed that the patients that had a, the strongest immune responses to the Kala vaccines were patients with essential thrombocytemia, and patients with myelofibrosis, actually two of them, patient three and patient 10, they didn't develop any immune response at all. And this is on par with other uh, results that we see from the lab, that patients with myelofibrosis generally, uh, they, they uh, show a weak immune response to antigens. So, Next thing was clinical. Uh, we wanted to assess whether there was a clinical effect, and uh, we looked at platelet counts because the Kala mutations mainly affect the, me the megakarya sites. So we had hoped for a decline in platelet counts in these patients. The patient that you see has a, a massive drop in platelets, had uh, was uh, re started receiving interferon alpha at this time point due, due to high thrombocytemia. And the patient here who developed uh, thrombocytemia, he had interferon alpha withdrawn due to side effects to interferon alpha therapy. So no effect on platelet counts. Of course, it was also interesting to look at the variant allele frequency of mutant Kala in the peripheral blood. No changes there either. So uh, we had really hoped for more. Uh, we didn't see any clinical responses, unfortunately. However, we showed two patients that actually after the trial showed a CD8 positive T cell response to stimulation with the mutant Kala epitope. Later on, we showed that uh, these CD8 positive T cells, they, uh, they had a, a HLA-B07 uh, restricted uh, target recognition, so they were only able to kill cells in, a, uh, in an HLA-B07 dependent manner. 
So what we then did, uh, then what, what we then did was that we, we had previously shown that CD4 positive T cells kill Kalar mutant target cells in a Kalar mutant dependent manner. And now we also showed that Kalar mutant specific CD8 positive T cells kill Kalar target cells in a Kalar dependent manner by using Kalar siRNA transfection uh, controls as shown here. So, um, it was quite, it's quite puzzling. Why don't the vaccines work? We see that we instate a CD4 positive T cell response, a CD8 positive T cell response, but we don't have any clinical effect. And we see rather strong immune responses after the vaccines. So why aren't the mutant cells cleared? And there's a vast plethora of explanations to this, and I hope that we can maybe take this uh, in, this, in the discussion. But uh, we have investigated whether uh, it could be a question of T cell homing. Because we vaccinate in the periphery, we, acti we activate uh, Kalar mutant specific T cells. But the question is, do these T cells home to the bone marrow and exert their killing function on the uh, cancer stem cells? So, what we did was we established T cell cultures specific from four different patients that were included in, in, in the trial, T cell cultures specific to mutant Kala. These T cell cultures were then used to, we, we, we analyzed um, Kala mutant specific T cells from these T cell cultures using, fa using uh, fact sorting. And then we sequenced the T cell receptors of these T cells that recognize mutant Kala. Next thing we did was that we isolated T cells from bone marrow from these patients acquired before entry in the vaccination trial and after entry in the vaccination trial. And we also sequenced the T cells in these patients. And the rationale beyond this was that we want to know whether these T cells up here, can we find them, the T cells that recognize mucin Kalar, are they present in the bone marrow? Maybe they're not present before entering the trial, but at least if we, have, we, if we were supposed to have an effect of, a, of the vaccine, the T cells should be present in the bone marrow after the trial. So the data just come in some weeks ago. We are still looking uh, at the data. This is a plot showing the frequency of T cells in the enriched, in the Kalar mutant specific T cells. And it shows for patient two and patient seven, from whom I made CD8 positive T cell cultures, that we have a highly, uh, that we have one clone that is highly prevalent in both the, the, the T cell culture derived from patient seven and the T cell culture derived from patient two. It's, uh, it's not that clear in patient one or in patient nine. So then we wanted to see, okay, these highly prevalent T cells in the Kalar mutant specific T cells, could we find them in the bone marrow before the trial and after the trial? And I don't have any figure to show you here because we can't find the T cells in the bone marrow, neither before nor after the trial. So even though there are th several methodological caveats using this method, we suggest that we have a homing problem, that the T cells simply are not able to home to the bone marrow and exert the killing function here. So to conclude, we have shown that the Kalar mutations are immunogenic. We, found, we find uh, both CD4 and CD8 positive T cells that recognize and kill target cells in a Kalar mutant dependent manner. We also have data that suggest we have an active tumor immune surveillance against mutant Kalar and healthy donors. Peptide vaccinations against mutant Kalar is safe and feasible. We induce uh, potent immune responses. However, we are yet to find a clinical effect. Some data, we have, we have data that suggests that specific T cells simply are not able to home to the bone marrow, but there are numerous other immune subversive mechanisms that could impede on the clinical effect of this vaccine. So by this, I would like to thank all of my collaborators, especially uh, Hans Hasselbalk and Mess Hellanersen, who have helped me a lot, and uh, coll collaborators, and of course, patients. And now uh, I would also like to thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Morten, for this stimulating presentation with many questions, I guess. First question. Uh, thank you very much. Very interesting, very nice. I am Dr. Shihab from Doha, Qatar. Uh, simple question. What is the duration of follow-up? And do you think with longer follow-up, we may see clinical impact? Uh, 
Yes, the follow-up is, uh, we, fo we still follow the patients actually, and you're totally right that we could maybe see a response later on, because that is a known fact in cancer immune therapy, that the response may come at a later time point. So we are still following the patients, and we're yet to still, uh, to, we are still to find or see a clinical response in the patients, unfortunately. Thank you. I know that in the Danish group you've studied a lot of immunity in these patients. Are there any, any clues about how, why patients with myelofibrosis didn't respond at all, at least the few you showed? Um, that's a very interesting question. It could maybe be that we have a tolerance to the, to the vaccination antigen, that the patients have been exposed to the antigen for so long, so we have exhausted uh, T cells. Um, but we really do not know. There's also this question about, about uh, immunoaging, that patients, they might be older, so, so the patients, they simply have, for example, uh, a high frequency of their T cells are specific to CMV, and this could also impede to, to, the, to the lack of responses in myelofibrosis. But generally, I think to, to use therapeutic cancer vaccination in patients with myelofibrosis, it's maybe not that good an idea because they have a very, um, their immune response is, is really weak, and we see that to both, uh, to pd one derived epitopes and arginase one derived epitopes. That's what we generally see. And apparently we can't, we can't enhance the immune response by, by vaccines. We have also several questions online. One from Magnus Bjorkholm uh, saying, nice talk. Homing of T cell for the spleen observed. Could you study this? Homing. Then I think we should use, yeah, then we should uh, splenectomize the patients, and I guess that wouldn't be a, a good idea. Um, uh, we could use a murine model maybe and see, a uh, murine vaccination model, and see whether the T cells they home to the spleen there. But I, I can't see any method to look at spleen homing um, in these patients uh, for now, unfortunately. But I do think that the main thing would be the T cells to, to, to home to the bone marrow and, and, and find out whether they can kill the calamutant cells there. Okay, maybe a, a last question from Tim Bromendorf. Could the lack of response in vivo also be linked to subclonal heterogeneity of color positive target cells? Uh, I think since we see that so many, that, this, that the patients have such a, a high color mutant variable allele frequency in the periphery, I think that the majority of, of the hematopoiesis consists of mutant color. So I would think that if we had any tumor specific immune response, we, we, it would impede on, uh, it will kill the color mutant cells. So I, I, don't, I do not think that's the explanation. We also have a question. Hello, thank you for the nice talk. My name is Christina. I'm from the Medical University here of Vienna. And I wanted to ask if you could envision um, using a TCR that you found in those uh, treated patients, cloning it, and then maybe use a preclinical model together with, um, with editing those T cells, for example, to, with a bone marrow homing factor to see if you can redirect them to the bone marrow if you get any efficacy. Really, really good question. I've been thinking about this since I got this data because I think we have a challenge with, with the immune system simply losing the battle in the periphery. We have so many mutant cells in the periphery, so even though we induce an immune response in the periphery, the T cells, they simply lose, they're simply not able to kill all the cancer cells in the periphery. So yes, I think we could maybe clone a TCR into autologous T cells, and then by some mechanism, I don't know how we should do it, some uh, molecular biologist would do that, then we should make these T cells home to the bone marrow by using a homing factor. And then first, when the cells are in the bone marrow, then they should express the T cell receptor specifically from mutant killer, because now we can't make the T cells home because they simply, they waste all their energy in the periphery on non-stem uh, cells. So that was a really good question. But I think it would be a project that will take many years to, to, to develop. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have to move now to the next presentation. Thank you, Monty. So just before the, ad the advent of vaccination, we have another immune therapy that works well in hematological malignancies, that is allogeneic stem cell transplantation. As you know, in myelofibrosis, this can be challenging due to the patient's condition.
Italian Paris will discuss the optimization of allotransplant in patients with MF. Thank you very much for the introduction and for inviting me uh, to give uh, this talk. And uh, first of all, uh, I would like to thank also my collaborators at San Luis Hospital, uh, uh, members of SFGMTC and EBMT. So um, here are my disclosures. The decision to transplant patients with myofibrosis is related to a multi-parametric algorithm taking into account the disease risk, patients, the donor type, alternative options, and the transplant procedure, including post allogenic events which cannot uh, be easily, unfortunately. So um, transplantation may be indicated when it usually gives a better survival than available alternative options. So we have to think about what are the alternative options, and there is still some debate regarding uh, the prolongation of survival uh, with rixolitinib, for instance. And we have to raise this question of the potential benefit for our patients. Is it to improve the quality of life or uh, is it to reduce the mortality? And uh, which is very important is to estimate what is the expected survival of your patient. So for that, we have, of, of course, many scores. So uh, here, uh, in the setting of allogenic transplant, we often use the dynamic score, and we can see that we have three or four groups of patients. Of them, the intermediate or high risk are, uh, have a survival less than four years usually. And if we uh, take the more recent uh, score, including cytogenetics and uh, somatic mutations. We have, again, three or four groups per score, giving a survival less than four years for the higher risk. And in parallel, if we try to estimate what can be the survival after transplantation, we also have other scores. And this one is the myelofibrosis uh, transplant scoring system. And according to all these parameters you can see on the left, after, after transplantation, the survival uh, is between 90 and 25, so very different. In addition, some post-transplant events are impacting uh, the outcome of these patients, especially graft failure and uh, acute or chronic GVHD. We unfortunately don't have prospective studies comparing transplant and non-transplant strategies, but we have some registry studies. And this is the first one, which include several hundreds of patients with myelofibrosis. And uh, that's before rixolitinib area in patients younger than 65. So this study is showing that at 10 years, there is a benefit to transplant patients if they are intermediate to or high, while that's the contrary uh, in the lower risk. More recently, Another study, including primary or secondary myelofibrosis, a study from CIBMTR, is uh, showing in uh, the red curves that transplantation is able to give a long-term survival, which uh, could be better than non-transplant strategy, but you can see that uh, the curves are crossing. And uh, especially for low risk, they are crossing at 10 years, so probably there is no indication of transplantation for these patients, and it's crossing between uh, three and four for intermediate to or high risk due to the non-relapse mortality, uh, which is quite uh, high just after transplantation. 
In this study, uh, some patients receive rixolitinib, and in the multivariable model, it gives some advantage uh, in terms of overall survival. Another interesting study has taken nine published studies to estimate transition probabilities in a multi-state model. You can see the, these states on the left. And this study shows that there is some benefit to transplant uh, the, the patients, for instance, uh, for patient, in patients intermediate one or two, there is a benefit in terms of gain of life expectancy if they can receive the transplant uh, before uh, the 24 months. So timing to transplant is a quite complex uh, issue. It requires a constant monitoring of patients. All studies have been done based on the DIPS. Patients who respond to a therapy and especially rexolitinib have a better outcome. And, and international recommendation do not recommend the, uh, transplantation in a lower risk, but only in a uh, higher risk, and sometimes in intermediate one risk if they harbor some uh, poor risk features. So now regarding the patients, patients with mild fibrosis uh, are, have some specificities. They are often uh, quite old uh, with splenomegaly. They also have a liver disease with portal hypertension hypertension and sometimes pulmonary hypertension. Of course, they have fibrosis. And uh, they have often a uh, history of thrombosis and renal failure. All these comorbidities increase the organ toxicity after transplantation and decrease uh, the, the engraftment uh, uh, by, um, and de decrease also the hematological recovery. So that's very important to uh, explore this patient before transplantation, especially for liver and heart. So we have several strategies to reduce the spleen size before transplantation. I will not, uh, I have no time to detail, but maybe we can discuss that, but uh, we can can use medication, splenectomy or spleen eye radiation, and uh, all of these uh, have some advantage or, or disadvantages. So um, on the left, you can see uh, an EBMT uh, study showing that patients who receive rixolitinib and who were responded to this treatment had a better outcome, while the other patients have similar outcome than patients who uh, did not receive rixolitinib. And uh, on the right, this is a single center study showing that as, uh, the splenectomy um, Give uh, before transplantation is followed by a better outcome. Regarding the donor, uh, patients with myelofibrosis have the best outcome using an HLA match sibling donor. That's uh, what we can observe in these uh, two figures. And um, using much unrelated donor, but especially mismatch unrelated donor, uh, the patient have worse uh, outcome. So uh, on the right, that's the French prospective study where patients either receive HLA match sibling uh, donor on blue, uh, no donor at all on yellow, and uh, unrelated or mismatch unrelated in green and uh, in red. So uh, when we look at these results using uh, mismatch unrelated donor, of course we think about uh, the role of haploidentical uh, donor, especially with the use of post-transplant cy cyclophosphamide. And that's true that uh, we have some uh, good signals for this kind uh, of donor with survival often more than 50% several years after transplantation. And here that's two different studies, one European and one American, showing a very encouraging uh, outcome. Regarding GVHD prophylaxis,
as it has been reported in other diseases and in phase three studies, ATG uh, decreased the risk of uh, GVHD in this specific uh, population. And regarding regimen, uh, I can say that uh, we don't know which regimen is the best for best for um, patients with myelofibrosis. fibrosis. But we know uh, that uh, the lower the intensity is, the higher the relapse uh, rate will be, unfortunately. And uh, that's possibly related to uh, worse donor chimerism. And in contrast, when we use a higher intensity uh, regimen, we have lower relapse, but we have higher non-relapse mortality. So maybe things will change with triosulfan that uh, I don't really know where it is in uh, the intensity scale, but uh, we have these uh, phase three randomized studies in myeloid disease showing uh, a lower mortality with uh, this drug. So several uh, studies are ongoing on, uh, with myelofibrosis to know if that's the best uh, or not uh, regimen. But anyway, when we compare RIC and MAC at the end, the overall survival uh, is similar. So I would say that uh, we may use ATG uh, in the setting of unrelated donor. HAPLO has probably uh, the room in this uh, disease. We should use reduced intensity uh, regimen to avoid uh, high non-relapse mortality, possibly based on fludarabine. But as I said just before, the optimal regimen is still unknown. After the transplantation, that's very important to monitor patients for uh, their disease, because that's a disease which is very sensitive to donor lymphocyte infusion. And here, th this figure illustrates uh, patients who had a positive uh, MRD measured by JAK2 mutation and uh, who receive DLI with a very good uh, response. And uh, generally, after transplantation, if the patient had some relapse, uh, he should receive uh, donor lymphocyte infusion because one third of the patient uh, can have a response. Poor graph in, in function or late uh, engraftment are very frequent in myelofibrosis patients. And there is also um, quite uh, good results uh, by re-injecting uh, CD34 positive cells in these uh, patients. Recently, some encouraging uh, results have been reporting uh, with the uh, second allogenic uh, transplantation in patients who relapse who, uh, or who uh, reject their first transplant. And finally, uh, when these patients are transplanted and alive and in remission uh, five years after transplantation, this, uh, we can compare their outcome uh, to their sibling. And for the majority of them, unfortunately, they still have a higher risk of mortality. And just for a subset of patients who are uh, women, younger than 45, they have the same survival than the general population. But at very long term, the main cause of the relapse of the primary disease. And the quality of life uh, is highly impacted by chronic GVHD. But the quality of life is considered well or very well for uh, almost 80% of uh, the patients. So to conclude, I would say that uh, selection to transplantation is a major point 
Myelofibrosis patients are usually fragile. Reduced toxicity regimens are indicated. Graft versus myelofibrosis effect is observed. And the challenge, of course, may be to decrease chronic GVHD to improve quality of life without increasing uh, disease relapse. Thank you very much for, for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Marie. Are there questions in the room? We have some questions online. So I will start with a question from Veronique Saada. Is there a room for ruxolitinib in maintenance post-transplant? So uh, in myelofibrosis patients, if we speak about a specific treatment after uh, transplantation, uh, like uh, ruxolitinib, uh, currently, uh, that uh, there is uh, no room for this treatment, even if many of them receive it at the end because they have a, an acute or a chronic GVHD. Uh, that's not considered as a maintenance uh, therapy, uh, possibly because that's also an immunosuppressive therapy. So. Uh, that can uh, even prevent uh, the graft versus myelofibrosis uh, effect. So that's not done uh, currently. Yes, question. Uh, I have two questions. The first one is if you uh, recommend any type of uh, ruxolitinib tapering before the transplant. And the second one, if you ask for a higher CD34 cell in the product for the transplant, knowing the poor graft function. Uh, regarding the discontinuation of rexolitinib before transplantation, that's true that uh, uh, in the French uh, trial uh, we, we have uh, started with uh, tapering uh, rexolitinib and uh, we observed some uh, rebound just after that or some things uh, which were um, similar to rebound. So uh, at the end, uh, in this prospective study, we stop uh, just before the transplantation, just uh, one day before. And after that, I don't know if this is uh, the consequence or not, but uh, we haven't observed uh, any more uh, rebound. And uh, for the number of uh, CD34 cells, uh, that's true that uh, uh, these patients uh, may uh, benefit from uh, a higher number of CD34 cells uh, in the, the, the graft. Yes. Thanks. We have a lot of questions online. I'm afraid we cannot answer them, but I will try to summarize one of them that is about the timing of, of transplantation, especially in young patients. How, when do you consider transplantation for very young patients, even if they are at low or intermediate one risk? Um, usually, uh, there is no emergency in this disease, which is quite practical. <laughs> So we, we can uh, monitor the disease. Uh, I think you speak about lower risk. Uh, so uh, when patients are intermediate one risk, uh, that's probably interesting to uh, score them with the all the genetics risk, just not to miss some uh, poor, poor feature. And that's uh, if they are young, we, even if uh, this patient is uh, intermediate one according to DIP, but he has some poor prognosis, somatic mutation, for instance, uh, that's a, a recognized uh, indication of uh, transplantation. So we have to, to monitor uh, the patient also just to, to check if uh, there is uh, some hematological um, uh, signal <laughs> during uh, the follow-up. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank also Claire Harrison for having set up such a fantastic program, I think. Thank, <coughs> thank you for all our speakers. And it's time now to go to the opening ceremony. Thank you very much. <laughs>